Welcome back to the Quiet Onset podcast powered by Cinnamon. I'm Yuan, and today I'm joined by Kevin, uh, our first time correspondent to go out to a festival for us and bring us a bit of coverage. So uh, welcome, Kevin. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very honored to have the title of your first correspondent. So uh, yeah. thanks a lot. I mean, you even went to a festival before Lachlan got to do that so oh. it's a special title for us he'll be waiting until we go to gun next year uh but uh, you attended the ghent uh film festival and watched over 30 uh, films there and now uh we're here to talk about those this is actually a a great opportunity because ghent showed a bunch of films that uh, i missed at the festivals that i attended uh this year and uh, we'll be hearing your thoughts on Empire of Light, she, uh, she Said, Devotion, and The Quiet Girl, uh, among a few that I also caught. Uh, we'll be discussing them uh, briefly as well with Banshees of Inishirin, Saint uh, Omer, Close, Bones and All, Living, and The Sun. So if you want to skip around to any specific movie that interests you in our coverage, you'll find the time codes uh, linked below. And uh, without further ado, uh, there's, well, there's also a rank list of Kevin's uh, films that he watched um, on Letterboxd uh, as well in the description, so go check that out. And uh, now, without further ado, can we hear what your highlight was, the best film coming out of Ghent? Uh, the best film of Ghent was actually the very first one I watched, so right. not, no movie uh, got above that bar, which uh, you'll be happy to hear is close. Uh, yes, by Lucas very happy to hear that. I, I watched the press screening of uh, Close, so I didn't go to the opening because Close is a Belgian movie, it's a Belgian Oscar submission, so mm. obviously there was a grand opening of it. I didn't go to that yes. screening, I went to the press screening, which was pretty packed by itself. And I will say, uh, so the term I used for Close was refined, because I mm. watched uh, uh, Lucas Don't feature film, uh, which is Girl, which should have been nominated for uh, Best National uh, Feature Film uh, back mm -hmm. in 2018. There was some backlash to Girl, uh, right. which uh, by an article which talked about transgender issues, and then everyone's like, oh, maybe we should not vote in that movie. So I think that was the case. But in uh, this very case of Close, it's refined because Lucas Don is really um, more comfortable in the director's chair. You can really see that. He has found his cinematic footing more. He has chosen a very specific style for him. And he's just way more confident. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you like the lead, right? Yeah. Uh, the camera is on the lead, like, a lot of the time. Wait, the lead is Adam Aiden Drambin. I definitely butchered that. But, like, the camera is, like, on him the whole time. And yeah. when they divert, to someone in the supporting cast, it is with a purpose, right? For example, mm -hmm. there's like a dinner scene with like where the father of a, a friend like gets very emotional and that's just with a purpose, right? And he obviously mm -hmm. has a great uh, opposite lead upon him, uh, Leon, I think it is. So yeah, uh, Close yeah. was my favorite movie of the festival. I know it's your favorite. It's my favorite of the year. It's my favorite since three years. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that uh, you connected uh, with it as well. And uh, can't wait for that wide release for Close, hopefully uh, sooner than later when it goes for that international uh, Oscar that it will hopefully take home um, as well. Now, there's a couple more films that, that I didn't catch and maybe uh, we'll get a couple of those out of the way uh, straight away. Uh, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on Sam Mendes' uh, Empire of Light. Empire of Light is a major mishit, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, you know, many people call it an ode to cinema. I counted about three and a half scenes that are about an ode that are an ode to cinema. And mm -hmm. so instead we get like a half-cooked story about racism uh, right. and a half-cooked romance story. So the racism, the racist uh, storyline is like, uh, you got like this guy, uh, black guy uh, who is played by Stephen Ward, I believe, um, who comes into the cinema uh, and lives in, in this town that is filled with skinheads and everything. And it's just very flat. And like it's a very flat storyline like mm -hmm. you know he's being abused he's being uh physically and emotionally abused but for the it doesn't go anywhere in the end 
and even the romance story is like i could only watch it with like one eye open you know like it's very mm-hmm. cringe like i'm aware there's this romance story and i will watch the romance story but i do not want to watch the romance story so right. um and i think this movie definitely suffers from uh the fact there is not a co-writer because sam mendes wrote this movie alone for the very first mm-hmm. time and i right. think he definitely needed another writer to just like give more nuance to certain storylines overall. And even Olivia Coleman can't uh, save that. Is, is she good in her performance? Is it just uh, Olivia Coleman? Like no, she's she's the best actress of our generation. Like like one of the best <laughs> actors of our generation. Let's yeah. not lie. I have so many mm-hmm. friends who like legit stan Olivia Coleman. Like for example, <laughs> in Heartstopper. So like um, mm-hmm. yeah, she's one of the best. Roger Deakins, some solid work. The score yeah. overall. Uh, I don't know who did it. Uh, I don't remember who did it, but like it's very decent. Uh, there is so there's a famous um, cinema s- scene, right? You've seen the still of Olivia Coleman in the theater, yeah. right? Like mm-hmm. everyone sees that. Everyone's like, that is the Oscar shot, right? Um, the movie she's watching, right? I don't know. I'm not gonna say it because like spoilers. But yeah, like, is it, is it a 1981 <laughs> movie? And I've mm-hmm. seen that movie. I wanted to watch that movie instead of this yeah. movie. So, you know, right. that's like that never a good sign. So, yeah, yeah. major miss hit uh, in general. I think the, the score was done by Trent Rasner and Atticus Ross. Uh, yeah. Who are, who are like uh, big up and coming when it comes to like whenever they do a, a score, it usually uh, stands out as being one of the highlights uh, of a film. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, interesting that you mentioned it here. Uh, I think something that I was quite disappointed by when I caught it at the premiere in Venice uh, was the son uh, follow up of the father that starred Olivia Coleman a little bit of a double tie over with <laughs> that yeah. and uh, yeah being a disappointment. Uh, how did you? Uh, what did you think about the son? Yeah, uh, the son. I didn't mind it right um, until the very end, where it's like mm-hmm. it's the nail in the coffin. Like this movie is just very manipulative. It yeah. is just um, like you. You said before to me, like, it's rotten to the core. I think it rottens to the core over the runtime of the movie. Like, it's not from the start. Yeah. It's not bad, but it just gets bad as the movie ends. Um, mm-hmm. And I just think the point where the movie really fails is actually in its lead, which is then McGrath's character, right? Yeah. It's, it's like mm-hmm. uh, Zello said, like, I, so you're going to play a depressing teen right and like he asked like oh okay what are my motivations um just you know your parents are divorced um <laughs> yeah, yeah that's about it i act depressed and i'm like okay you're not gonna give him much more uh so i think that's where the movie really fails and i'm not calling mcgrath yeah. a bad actor uh because he does show promise in this movie it's just that he's very inconsistent and i think that's because of the script i don't know how yeah. you feel about that he really doesn't get uh, anything beyond that uh, marriage uh, troubles yeah. caused my depression. And uh, that's, that's a pity because it, it feels like a really bad depiction of depression and, and how far reaching it can go in affecting your whole family. Uh, and, and yeah, just a major disappointment. I hope with the mother, he'll swing back around uh, to something that, uh, that I can say I enjoy. Well, they, they are in your top six. Uh, if you look at your ranked list, there are four films uh, in total that, that I have not seen yet. Uh, and I think those are Oink, Utama, Small, Slow, But Steady, and The Quiet Girl. So uh, could you tell us a bit more about those four films? The surprise of the festival is Oink. I'm not going to lie, right? Yeah. Uh, the Dutch title is Knorr, but... I just prefer oink, because, like, how fun is it to say <laughs> oink, right? Uh, but, yeah, like, I, I compared it to the movie um, My Life is a Zucchini by uh, mm-hmm. Celine yep. Sciamma, right? This is a movie very much in the same vein as uh, My Life is a Zucchini, right? It's a stop-motion animated movie. It's a very mm-hmm. fun animated uh, movie. It's a bit predictable, right? You get uh, a daughter, gets uh, a pig as a gift from her grandfather who returns home after 25 years in America. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, th- we need to, they need to um, teach this pig some manners in order to stay uh, home, right? right? 
because uh, the mother, like, she she hates the pig, uh, obviously. Like, why do we have a pig? Uh, mm-hmm. So, because originally the daughter wanted the dog, right? Uh, yeah. So, no, this pig farts a lot, shits a lot everywhere, um, <laughs> eats a lot, you know? Like, it's a very mm-hmm. fun movie, right? At a certain mm-hmm. moment, they say, I this puppy needs to behave better. Let's uh, do a puppy exam with him, right? And then he's, like, in a puppy exam with other puppies. And he's just a shitting, farting pig, you know? Yeah. So like, it's so, so <laughs> much fun. And I honestly think it's the best animated movie of the year. Interesting. I, yeah. Wow. I haven't Hopefully seen many. We'll get to see it as I well. Think it's going to be up there. Mm-hmm. So you would root for it uh, to, to get into an Oscar nomination as I well? I honestly do. I honestly do. It's so much fun. Will be fun up there. I, I'm not like too caught up with uh, what the five. Uh, front runners would be right now but it certainly would be a fun um like uh you know shake up uh, yeah for that category that's usually dominated by pixar which i, I don't see them dominating this year uh so so yeah we'll see which Maybe. pixar movie even came out i have no clue but light light year but no one saw it oh <laughs> <laughs> well i saw it it was it wasn't great it doesn't have a shot at winning uh and i think turning red was still in the cycle last year I, um, i'm not entirely sure if that's this year or not uh but um but yeah there's 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 more what other films uh, there's more yeah um yeah you know what i'll say the quiet girl was the second best movie of the festival for me the quiet girl was a very it's a very complete movie right Mm -hmm. and actually all of these movies you've uh, named at the beginning right they are very small scale movie right but they tell a very complete story that Mm -hmm. don't get bigger they don't get bigger as they like need to be. They stay, they stay small scale, right? The yeah. Quiet Girl mm-hmm. is a great directed movie. And again, just as close, a great lead performance from like a very, very young child. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to say the Irish uh, actress, which is uh, because like Irish names, as you've heard in Banshees of Insurance, like they yeah. are tough to pronounce. Not too easy. <laughs> There's, there's, a, there's a Venn diagram of overlapping pronunciation uh, when it comes to uh, House of the Dragon characters and Irish names. Yeah. They're not equally as hard. Yeah, no, The Quiet Girl was a very complete movie about a girl uh, who stays with her aunt and uncle uh, for the summer mm-hmm. as, like, at her home. It is way too busy with a new uh, baby on the way. And, like, the fact she has, like, five or four brothers and sisters already there. And right. like she's ve- she's a very introverted girl, um, doesn't say much. For the record, she's a quiet she's girl. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, she's, she's oh, a okay. very quiet okay. girl. But she Never isn't mind. mute because yeah, like a lot of people right. think like, oh, she's not gonna say anything. Nah, she's not mute. She just like only says things when she's supposed to say something, uh, as right. her, as, her, as her uncle says in the movie. So mm-hmm. yeah, like it's a very universal movie too. Like it takes place in the seventies, so mm-hmm. it's a very universal movie that's still relevant today. Um, another movie, small, slow, but steady. I will say that movie might uh, just relate more with me than with others because it's a story about a deaf woman and I'm like, I'm like hard of hearing. So mm-hmm. it might relate more with me than others. But like, again, it's a grainy, very warm um, movie in, uh, in the form of a boxing movie because like she's a boxer, a professional mm-hmm. boxer, that is. So you can only yeah. imagine the obstacles that come with it. She's deaf. She doesn't hear the bell. She doesn't hear the referee. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, a very aware movie for how unaware she can be, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, no, then, it does, yeah. And then the final movie is Utama, which I catched at home. I didn't manage to go to the press screening. Mm-hmm. But Utama uh, is a pretty small-scale movie too. But that is a movie that manages to tell a bigger story than the characters are uh, in it. Because like it, uh, it's a movie about climate change, right? Mm-hmm. And I think this movie is pretty effective in its message about climate change, even though it never mentions it. Because it's, right. it's about a very old uh, Bolivian couple, I believe, uh, who lives in like a hut very far away from others. Uh, mm-hmm. And like it just hasn't rained in a very, very long time, which is, of course, uh, very problematic for their uh, garden, uh, for the fact they have a lot of llamas. Uh, and like on a day, uh, the grandson comes by 
and like says like do you want to live with us in the city and like the grandfather refuses to do that um so yeah it's very it's a very beautiful movie about climate change mm -hmm. that doesn't say it's about climate change so yeah like i love that movie i love the opening shot of that movie i've posted it uh i like i've sent that shot because uh like you can download stills from the film festival platform i've downloaded yeah. that still and i've sent it to a hundred of people at least <laughs> like i love that opening shot so yeah. so much <laughs> <laughs> so yeah my top six uh are almost just very small scale movies but movies i love now uh i i guess there's a couple more films in your top 10 and those we do a bit uh have, have a bit of an overlap of what we've seen and those are uh a top ranking we got uh, at your first place banshees of inashiran and then uh seventh through 10 is saint omer living uh bones and all and holy spider so so let's talk about uh those which one do you want to start with let's start with the highest one with banshees banshees oh man well uh where does banshees rank among your mcdonald's um like ranking at the very top i i think i like it the most yeah yeah. Uh, what about you? Uh, for me, it's like number three. Uh, I I did rewatch three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, just before the film festival to just remind me how great mm -hmm. of a director and mostly screenwriter uh, Martin yeah. McDonough is. Uh, and I do think Three Billboards and Seven Psychopaths are better than Banshees of Inisherin, but I think Banshees of Inisherin is the most unique in terms of story. And in terms of setting, mm -hmm. especially the latter one, because like it takes place on a Irish village in an Irish yeah. little island. Just the mainland is like a, like just a couple of kilo kilometers away, and uh, I think the juice of the story really lies in the fact because it's a breakup story. But like uh, Brendan Gleeson character Colm just breaks the cuts the friendship off in a very sudden way. To the point mm -hmm. where even like the basics of man, the basics of civil manners are not respected anymore. It's like just a mm -hmm. basic hi, a basic like how are you doing? Like that is just not existent between these characters anymore. Yeah. Um, but for me, the standout honestly has been growing on me, which is Barry Barry Keown's uh, performance. I think that one mm -hmm. might be my favorite, even though everyone is uh, rooting for Colin Farrell's. How about you? Which one is your? Uh, for me, I, I'm I'm rooting for Colin Farrell. I also, uh, when it comes to lead performance, I think there's, there's a couple of people up there from from other films as well that I really in, enjoyed. But uh, I think Barry, I I never know how to uh, pronounce his last name. I think it's Barry Keegan, but as uh, the Keo, I, I'm not entirely sure. It's again the the Irish. It's it's hard to pronounce because he's he's proper Irish, and uh, it, it's such a uh, like an endearing little tale about this. I guess a small town and um, their biggest drama happening uh, as it unfolds uh, with two people or one guy who doesn't want to talk to the other guy when they go for uh, the 2 p.m. beer, which by the way, it, it, like drinking at 2 p.m. kind of early, uh, but I guess it's all you can do on that island. Uh, it's so endearing. Like you said, it's it's uh, uh, like his, his writing is amazing. It's one of the rare uh, like um, scre uh, scripts and screenplays that, that are like the co-host of the of our podcast, Lachlan, um, really reads. He has read, I think, his all of his screenplays at least once or twice. Uh, and again, with this one, uh, it's the strongest aspect as well, and it's got some captivating performances in it. So uh, definitely a front runner for me for for uh, one of the best films of the year. Besides close. <laughs> Besides close, but that that deal is closed, and I, I don't think anyone's uh, anything's getting getting in there but I, I predicted that it might be Lachlan's favorite film of the year and he's had like some strong contenders uh films that he's really enjoyed so far so I'm right. confident that a lot of people will connect with the Banshees of Inishirin yeah wh what what about some other films uh Banshees is great go seek it out uh France's uh, Oscar submission Saint Omer what did you think of that Saint Omer uh it won the prize at Film Fest Ghent um uh, the jury prize that is and uh as far as it won something at Venice as well. Uh, I'd won something at, at Venice as well, if I remember correctly. Oh, you won something at Venice, yeah. Well, the, yeah. I, I don't think it's going to win the prize of the public, uh, 
But yeah, Saint Omer, I really liked it. I know you didn't like it as much as I did. No, not 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 as much. No, I've been asked about it a couple of times. Uh, like for someone who does the distribution in Switzerland, I was I was talking to someone who's like working there, and I was like, oh, what do you what do you think about our films? We're doing Saint Omer, and I was like, yeah, no, it's fine. I had to dance around the fact that I I found it really stale. Uh, where it's just basically a courtroom drama for two thirds of the film, I'd say. Yeah. And I, I didn't really, it didn't really grab me in any sort of way. Although I think there's this really great performances in it. You probably would agree. But uh, how how did you stay stay in that space? What what uh, made you uh, enjoy it more than I did? Well, um, I think just honestly the script, like mm-hmm. very very sharp script, and just um. Again, like as with the same with clothes, the camera stays on the lead, which is like mm-hmm. the defendant in this case, which is uh, which which is named Laurence Colli. Like that's the name that gets that the most. But yeah, it's just the fact. You know, this is the courtroom drama. I've seen so many American courtroom dramas, which is like objection, like you know, and like a lot of walking. Like this isn't it. Like this is honestly just a very raw and honest portrayal of a courtroom drama of like a real um courtroom case um mm. so yeah like it's it brought in a very sophisticated way the same with close honestly like saint omer is the reason why i don't want to stay close is locked in for a win because right. you've got like another movie where the director of this movie of saint omer is like very confident in his in her director chair it has mm-hmm. two amazing leads and brings this movie in a very sophisticated way. Um, and it's a very, also a very relevant movie because like, it's also a movie about immigration. It's a movie yeah. about um, childhood. The plot point of this movie is the fact that um, the one who is being charged, the defendant of this movie has killed uh, her 15 month old baby. So that's yeah. also like a story about motherhood, which many people can relate to. So honestly, I just love. Well, maybe not the killing part. Well, yeah. Fair point. Nah, I, w- I was actually very invested in this movie. So right. Yeah, I I think it was at the uh, latter half of the Venice Film Festival, and I had seen like one or two. I, I had seen like Argentina, nineteen eighty five, and uh, Lord of the Ants uh, were two films where uh, it was already a court drama within there, uh, and I was kind of just filled up to the brim when it comes to court stuff. And then Saint Omer was this really slow study of of someone on the court on trial uh, as defendant and. I guess I just wasn't ready for it. I think I definitely need to revisit it, uh, especially if it does get that Oscar nomination. But I had a couple of other French films, even one of them being uh, some uh, one uh, that we'll talk about uh, maybe a bit later, uh, that that I had in front of Saint Omer. But um, yeah, I mean, if it's got a shot at getting a nomination, I will say that's great for France. I've heard people say like I I could have watched the movie. So the movies. Uh... You said uh, it's two thirds of a drama, a courtroom drama. So yeah. you basically get like the the, the courtroom drama, and they're like breeders between the courtroom drama. Yeah, um, between the days, for me, yeah. that those parts either hit or miss, right? So yeah, like yeah, I, I didn't really get like the the structure of it all. Why we um, intro the film with someone who's just uh, basically a bystander. And, and watching it along. I think I need to revisit it, maybe read some other people's opinion on it, why that framing was necessary or why they chose that. But I, it just that that's why I didn't connect with it because it shifted its focus so much. And uh, I don't know if, if it was supposed to be like more commentary focused on, we are just looking at this trial and try to uh, maybe, I don't know, think about our own biases that we have in situations uh, like this where we judge someone or someone is, is defending themselves. Uh, it, it definitely needs to be revisited. I might land uh, more positively on it. I am very I excited to watch Argentina 1985, though. Like, I'm very excited to watch that. And that is out now on Prime, so you can go check that out, by the way. I will. What did you think uh, about the, the remake of Akira Kurosawa's classic Ikiru with the British version called Living with Bill Nye? I haven't seen it. So I went into this movie uh, knowing like it was a remake from a Kurosawa movie, which is like a huge, like there was a lot of pressure on that movie, right? 
of being a remake from Kurosawa, right? You gotta do it justice. And I think it did. I have not watched the uh, original one, but I think it really justified it. Uh, not only from like acting uh, perspective, but from a technical standpoint, Living is amazing, right? The score in mm-hmm. of Living is amazing. Obviously, the script. I do know the original one is a uh, like two and a half hours, and this one is like one hour forty. I I will say I am here for the Bill Nye's Oscar campaign. Right. Okay. That's uh, that's high praise. Yeah. Yeah. Nah. He's amazing in this movie. The fact is, I don't think he's ever been nominated for an Oscar. If I'm wrong. Yeah, he he's like perceived as this uh, like an actor with a lot of prestige, but he's actually just had a lot of like supporting roles, even in smaller films or even like in in not as acclaimed films, and he's just kind of carries himself in that way, which which makes him perfect for the role. Uh, I, I, like for me, it, it it's hard. Uh, I was really skeptical because Akiru is probably in my top five favorite films of all time. Oh, you watched uh, the original? Yeah, I oh. adore it. Uh, and I think, uh, you mentioned the, like the runtime, uh, that's about like 40 minutes, uh, different than longer in there. There's a lot of like time that this one feels more modern in the sense that it doesn't stay in scenes, uh, like as much. And I think like experiencing Ikiru was to me a way to like, actually like it means to live, right? It feels like you, you are doing that. Uh, to live as well, and not spoiling, I guess where the, where the story goes if if you haven't seen Ikiru or Living. Um, but the uh, like the the last chapter of of Ikiru is really long, uh, way longer than it is in Living. Um, because it becomes, uh, I guess, a bit. Um, it, it does become like hard hard to to watch in a sense. Um, and it feels like it's it's like the the weakest aspect, but it turns it turns into pretty much the strongest one by the end. And I think they nailed it in Living as well to uh, adapt it faithfully and add a bit of British spice into it all. Uh, so yeah, I, I I can recommend Living as well for those who don't want to watch the original for some reason. Go see that as well because it's amazing. The original for sure now to see which one I like more. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's going to be super interesting to see like people who uh, watch Living first, what they think of Akira because I've talked to a couple of people because this premiered all the way back in... Uh, at Sundance, and oh. uh, yeah, a couple of people I talked to that watched it there, uh, most of them hadn't seen Ikiru, uh, and I assume that's going to be for for most people, uh, the experience is going to be like that, uh, which is similar to, uh, I guess, the, wait, where do I have it? I think I do have it somewhere. Hold on, give me one second. <laughs> I'm very curious what you're going to pull out. Wait, I need to rephrase that. I'm going <laughs> to... Yeah, you should. <laughs> but I got bones and all. Uh, it's I... an adaptation of a book from Camille uh, D'Angelis. Uh, and it's now a major motion picture from Luca Guadagnino starring Taylor Russell, Timothy Chalamet, and Mark Rylance. So what did you make of Bones and All? Bones and All is a very solid movie. I don't think it's as shocking uh, of a cannibal movie if you've seen other cannibal movies like Raw yeah, or like uh, Raw, yeah. Gra- mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like I was mm-hmm. like, oh, so this is basically an American road trip movie version of Raw. Um, yeah. But don't get me wrong, I still very much like the movie. Um, Timothy Chalamet is great. Uh, I get why people are like really rooting for him. Um, because you you gotta be aware, right? Before I walked into this movie, the only reactions I had seen from Bones and all was how hot he was. Like, <laughs> he was I, very hard at uh, like in that dress before any of the pictures were snapped and it was shared all over social media. I saw him step out of that uh, car in that red dress and coincidentally, just randomly, I was there as well. Uh, so, so yeah, he did not, look great in it. Uh, also in the film, he does look hot. In the film, <laughs> he yeah, just, like... yeah, he nails it. <laughs> I was just, I just wanted to mention that he looked great on the red carpet again. I'd like to remind people. Yeah, like you've seen him in like flesh. And blood. Like. I've seen them in flesh, bones and all, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, so mm. yeah, now bones and all, a very solid movie. Uh the only part I will say by the way, uh at a certain moment they play a song which was also in Joker, and like that pulled me out of the movie so much. I was like, <laughs> Whoa. Right. Like this is an what? odd decision. Uh, yeah, I think mm-hmm. it was like Atmosphere by Joy Division. Uh so mm-hmm. like when that song came on, I was like, wait a minute, 
absurd choice. Um, also, the storyline with Mark Rylance, I very much liked the storyline, uh, the introduction of Mark Rylance's character. Like, mm -hmm. he honestly is a bit of the MVP for me. Because, like, you see this guy. Right. I watched Phantom of the Open uh, earlier this year. Like, he's mm -hmm. a very charming guy there. And now he's playing, like, an absolute psycho. And I absolutely yeah. adore him for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I don't know what that says about me. Um, <laughs> you adore psycho, so... You, I'm a psycho, too. Yeah. A Belgian psycho. <laughs> Joker moment in here. Cue the music up. Cue the music, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> but now, what did you make of the Mark Ryan story line? I, I think I came out of it kind of lukewarm. Um, because overall, I think that, of course, without spoiling, that by the third act and by the finale, it... Uh, it does want to have like a big ending moment. And I feel like it didn't need to have a big ending moment. It could have been like more a slice of life ish as it is like, as well as coming of age. You don't need that like big moment. It's like the American moment of each fucking movie needs to have like a speech moment where someone is addressing the public. It is so uh, cliched. And I don't know if that's like part of the novel as well that like it ends there. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm about like, a chapter in. I'm really oh. not far ahead. Uh, I've just just been too busy to read, uh, and I'm kind of curious to see where, it, like, how it ends there, of like how close um, they adapted it. But uh, and which I, I part they potentially scrapped, and which part they added, right? So. Exactly, exactly. And uh, so far, there's there's quite a few changes early on already with a backstory. Uh, uh, but it's that's very different from the opening. So I assume uh, Guadagnino changed a couple things around. Um, but yeah, Bones and All gets a recommendation from the both of us, I think. Yeah. Uh, lastly, uh, number 10 spot on your list, uh, Holy Spider. Holy Spider. Actually, this movie uh, was not in my top 10 originally, but it actually grew on me a lot. Uh, also because it's actually very relevant. Um, as mm -hmm. this movie debuted, uh, as this movie was shown uh, at Filmfest Ghent, uh, the prison in Iran, where like two famous filmmakers uh, are residing, uh, mm -hmm. got caught on fire. Uh, yeah. And they're apparently like, you know, they got like beat up or something too. I'm not entirely sure. But like, there's a lot of anger in Holy Spider, right? And yeah. that anger mostly uh, gets shown in the second half of the movie, because the first half of the movie is more of like a serial killer movie. Uh, inspired mm -hmm. by like Jack the Ripper basically um and that is very like interesting too right um so yeah like the guy who plays the Jack the Ripper type is very very intimidating I saw a picture of him on the on the web carpet of film at Ghent and I was like that is not the dude I saw in the movie so like he mm -hmm. he really changed a lot of uh, his physique and just like his look uh and he did that brilliantly the actress who played the journalist uh really like advocates like she's banned from um iran too so like yeah. you know she's really advocate for this movie and hopes it, like a lot of people see it and i do hope a lot of people see it too so I don't yeah know. i agree yeah you liked it a lot i i liked it quite a bit uh, it got the the best lead performance uh when it premiered at gun um and i think it's it's deservedly so uh it's really a, a interesting depiction of uh, the where culturally Iran is at, where it is in turmoil, where it is hopefully uh, changing some things. And at the forefront, we got a really strong uh, female lead uh, that has to to fight against the uh, really um, oppressionistic uh, government that uh, doesn't really see a cause in, um, I guess. Uh, bringing a murderer to justice in a sense where like they they're just so disinterested in um covering uh covering up this mystery and like finding the person responsible because they uh deem people of a certain like social standing or profession uh not worthy of of their time or, or even living and it's 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 hard to watch it feels at times a bit exploitative of uh i guess that type of story uh whenever you do cover a murderer because you do tend to idolize him in a way just by putting them on screen but i think uh through the lead in holy spider you kind of balance that out 
uh, and ultimately, I think it's a, it's a film uh, really worth seeing. It, it is based on true events too. So exactly, yeah, yeah. Which, which like that that's usually like the the controversial uh, side. We I think most recently we've seen it with like Dharma and that series explore. Um, exploding and i feel like there they don't really nail that aspect and here it feels more like much more like the need uh to to showcase the story to give uh people uh the voice to be heard and like to spark some change um in and outside i mean inside i don't think that a lot of people will see this but we are seeing it with uh the the protests and like the the stuff in iran happening right now uh there is there is hopefully a change coming there and um yeah for the outside world peeking in maybe holy spider uh also for the people uh who are excited for the last of us because uh mm -hmm. the director of holy spider is directing an episode or two of that show oh, so right. that's one of the reasons why i was really excited to watch the this movie and like yeah, yeah i'm really excited to see what ali abassi will do with the last of us so for the people who are excited for that show and want to see the international talent that that show has uh, hired, go watch mm -hmm. Holy Spider. I, I guess let's continue on the Iranian train and talk about a film that, that you just uh, informed me about uh, before we started. Is is banned in Iran now? Leila's Brothers? So yeah, Leila's Brothers, uh, a very engrossing Iranian family drama. And like, it just sucks. This movie just sucks in the sense of like, this family is just like digging a deeper and deeper are great for themselves and it just yeah. hurts to watch that um, but yeah this movie got banned from iran uh the excuse of the ban is for the fact that um they played it at can without the permission of the Ira iranian um like government mm -hmm. uh, but i think this movie would be banned regardless of that and i just think they're covering it up with that excuse um but yeah, yeah latest brothers it just hurts to watch this family um also, uh, two actors of this movie have been uh, have been hashtag me too, uh, being uh, sexually like uh, really? have been charged with sexual assault. So oh, okay. yeah, maybe that's also not a very uh, good thing to say about the movie. But the movie is very very good. I I didn't know anything about it. Well, that's just kind of it got overshadowed. Uh, I think coming out of Gun. Uh, by a lot of factors, not winning like anything, but now I guess uh, that is kind of the nail in the coffin um, for that. Ultimately, if uh, yeah, there's other controversy ar surrounding it. I think it's a really solid film. It's like film that's two and a half hours long or even longer, and to me, didn't feel like that or like I was never bored. Uh, I I was really um, entranced in in the story of of this struggling family just trying to stay above water well yeah this movie isn't depressing it's fully fully depressing obviously like there are a lot of yeah. tender and funny moments uh i do like the rooftop conversations they have in this movie which are like quite a few between Layla's mm -hmm. and uh ali Reza's, uh character so yeah, yeah like when those two talk about like their future and just like the circumstances uh iranian families Find, find themselves in so like those are the moments that like really hit me and i really appreciate it so mm -hmm. yeah and the wedding scene the wedding scene is pretty pretty great i won't the lie. wedding scene is pretty crazy yeah uh one of the highlights of the film all right there's a couple more films on the list that i have not seen uh those are devotion heaven akaras she said and sick of myself so uh let us know about that uh let us know about those is devotion uh, can, can it hold the water to something like top gun maverick is it, well, is it worth seeing the, as well the comparison between top gun maverick and devotion is inevitable mm -hmm. mostly exactly, because yeah. of its third act right so the third yeah. act is the most action-packed act uh and it like it's in similar territory right you got snowy mountains you got like mm -hmm. Obviously, in Top Gun Maverick, they don't show or name the enemy, but it is yeah. pretty obvious who the enemy is. If you like, mm -hmm. watch some of the like just the the description of the enemy territory, for example. But yeah, yeah nah, Jonathan Majors in this movie is really, really good, right? And it's yeah. the subject of this movie is also really important because it's about the first black Navy pilot, um, mm -hmm. and where. The movie really stands on its own compared to Top Gun Maverick. The fact 
that this is a, this is a war drama, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of action until the third act. This movie really builds up um, the action. It really builds momentum towards it. And yeah. of course, you got uh, Glenn Powell in this movie as well. You yeah. don't see his uh, six packs. I'm sorry, guys, uh, in this movie. But no, Glenn no Powell, beach scene. Yeah. So there's there's no beach scene. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. like devotion is pretty pretty great. A pretty mm -hmm. crucial story to tell in a not really you know ham fisted way or something. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, can you say the same thing about She Said, or does it feel exploitative of the time uh, of, of Me Too? Well, that's the thing, right? Before I went into this movie, I'm like, okay, this is like five years, six years after, you know, the, the movement of Me Too really... Yeah, uh, picked up momentum. Picked up, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she Said, I haven't seen many journalistic movies, right? I haven't seen uh, All the Predated Men's. I haven't seen Spotlight, for example. I know yeah, huge uh, blind spots, but she said it's a very solid uh, journalistic movie. It does mm -hmm. rush its setup really quickly. Like it brushes over its setup to get instantly to the investigation of the Me Too uh, movement uh, for Harvey Weinstein, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, like it really rushes its setup. Zoe Kazan and uh, Kerry Mulligan are really good. The movie does feel a bit repetitive though because like mm -hmm. they go to different women ask for their stories and sometimes one of their stories is a bit more impactful than the others so it's like like obviously you don't want to say like oh this story sucks because obviously it's a story that has a lot of emotional gravitas but like yeah. it does feel repetitive at some times and the ending is very solid too like they don't show the actual movement of it, they really narrow themselves on the investigation, which is right. what if that is is what you wanted to see, you'll get, basically. So yeah, yeah. I don't know if exactly. you hired for C set. I'm I'm quite interested to see that. I'm I'm more interested in uh, women talking than over she said. Uh, that's kind of my highlight of the films where it focuses around um women i guess i don't know that have i mean a... she said and women's talking like that's a great double feature right, it's very titles. close right. it would be oh and one thing i wanted to mention was maria shader uh maria schader i guess if you mm -hmm. want to like go with the german name In german yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um like she really grounds this movie to the like in reality because like you mm -hmm. can very easily go over the top which she said right in uh I haven't seen the movie, but Bombshell goes yeah. like very over the top. You could it have does. gone it's over the great. top with this movie too. Uh, but yeah. Maria Schrader really like grounds this movie in reality. Like she does, there is no screaming of like, ah, like I hate you, Harvey Weinstein, or something like that. Like no, like yeah, it doesn't show Harvey Weinstein either. So like, yeah, to, great it, choice. No Some people would have done that. There. But great choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we got time for a one uh, <laughs> last thing. I want to hear about Sick of Myself. Uh, I missed that one at Cannes. What can you yeah, tell Sick us about of that myself. one? Um, gets compared a lot to the worst person in the world. I don't think it's nearly as great as uh, what, the worst person Because it's also in Norwegian? Or why? Wait, 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 wait. Uh, because it's also from Norway? Or why is it the uh, comparison there? Well, that one thing, right? Uh, I know also Anderson, yeah. Anderson Daniel Sun Lee is also in this movie. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So right. he had only one scene, though, so don't expect much of him. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, nah, Sick of Myself is a movie about a very narcissistic person who, like, she wants to put herself out there in the world, but, like, nobody wants her. So mm -hmm. she takes pills and gets, like, very ugly and deformed uh, in her face and her arms. Uh, and then people see her and are like have empathy for her uh, and feel pity for her. And yeah, nah, this is a very solid concept that unfortunately really ramps itself into the ground. Uh, like it does not keep up its momentum uh, for very long. Uh, the lead is solid, but after a while, I was I just checked out of the movie. I'm not gonna lie. Right. Okay. Well, that's yeah. That's disappointing to hear. Um, because I was I was hoping for something great. I, I liked her in Ninja Baby. Had an opportunity to talk to the the lead actress as well, and she was she was talking about that film 
um, that she was doing, and I think another action film, um, uh, right as uh, like at the start of, of our interview. I think it didn't make it into the cut, but that's information you don't need. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on and giving us the coverage uh, for again to maybe next year. We'll uh, we'll get you back uh, there to to cover the films that we I, missed. I will and... try to watch more movies than next year than even this year if you want me to wait there's a couple more we didn't get to uh, if you are interested there's also going to be uh kevin socials link below you can go check out all the short little on the fly reviews he did for the films he caught at ghent and uh yeah uh thanks for tuning in uh subscribe and leave a like if you haven't already for more coverage coming to you weekly on the quiet and set podcast as well as uh, our festival recaps and uh we'll see you soon thank you for having me